I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Basting? Here. Chambers? Here. Dahl? Dunn? Here. Lindsay? Here. Duffus? Here. Sullivan? Here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second it. Any questions? Lindsay? Yes. Steffes? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Chambers? Yes. Dahl? Sorry. Dunn? Yes. Fasting? Yes. Okay, anybody on the board receive any communications that they want to bring forward? Good thing, I guess a good thing, the uh, options and education had a lunch in, after the Veterans Day program. And there was a lot of people that went out and they were very pleased with that, I guess. They hosted for the veterans and their families. I heard good things about that. I just want to share some feedback about the, uh, the musical. People seem to really love it. Uh, my family went on Friday. It was great. So, I know that was a lot of hard work and time put in, so well done. I'll, Mr. Austin received a communication along the same lines. I'll pass it around because the individual that sent it didn't necessarily know that it might be given to the board, so we won't read it out loud, but just, again, very complimentary to time, effort, performance, and just very complimentary to Middle Point Music Department School District for that support, so. Well, unfortunately, I wasn't able to think of it, but I heard nothing but good. Do we have anybody from, anybody sign up for citizens? Anybody in the audience have anything to bring forward? I didn't think there was anything that I walked by. Nope. Just ditto on the musical. It was awesome. No, I'm signed up good. Okay, thank you. HSR, Tim, you're up. Okay. Here's the board board. So I did pass on a little hand out here. Um, I'm gonna pull through it as we kind of keep going. Uh, so tonight, uh, we're at really a fun stage. We have some more, um, this time just looking at floor plans and site plans. We have some three-dimensional views of what this thing can look like, especially the interior and the exterior. Uh, so we'll be looking at that. We want to talk a little bit about focus on energy, the rebate. Um, we've been meeting with focus on energy folks, and we do have a rebate um, incentive that we want to talk about a little bit more. Uh, continue site planning as well as exterior, interior review, and then talk continuation of construction phasing of how best to go about actually implementing this. Um, so focus on energy, uh, I believe a couple of meetings ago, a couple months ago, we talked about going through this process. Um, on the left hand side here is basically the process that we're going through. So we already did the enrollment, we did the analysis. Um, results is basically where we're at right now. Um, so I do have a full page report and Roger was part of this as well. Um, from the district side of things. Uh, it's a 28 page report um, from Focus on Energy. Basically we partner with Focus um, to capture rebates and incentives to offset any incremental costs of energy efficient strategies. Um, during, this is during the design phase, during the construction phase, after this gets bid out, after it gets implemented, they do a verification to prove that what we said was put in and then you receive the incentives as part of that. Um, we went through all sorts of analysis of how to best to get there. Um, what they're proposing for energy savings is every year an uh, incremental cost of about $22,000 um, of energy savings. This bundle two that we're talking about is our baseline design. So this is what we are planning. Um, basically it's offsetting, um, putting in more variability so that your chiller system isn't running at 100% all the time. It's putting in controls so that we can ramp it up and down. It's uh, adjusting airflows. It's doing uh, occupancy sensors. It's, in our opinion, doing the right thing. 
And that's why basically bundle two is our base design. Is it's strategies that we would have already put in, and now we're able to capture uh, rebates to be able to help incentivize that. Um, so energy savings is about $22,000 um, estimated. And then your incentive that you'll receive, you'll get a check if we were to go steam ahead, of approximately $26,000 from um, Focus on Energy um, as well. There is a design incentive as part of this as well. Um, basically, you're already paying us to do this type of service, so you'll get uh, another incentive as well that's not identified here. Um, that's also your money. So you welcome reading it more. It is really interesting. Um, a lot of engineering kind of went into it, but this kind of snapshots of the results through that. Um, floor plan looks very similar. Um, very few minor tweaks. More here for reference than anything. It's also in your packet. Um, so our second floor, level level. So we did touch on this um, a little bit earlier. So this is the proposed parking um, drop-off and pickup area. Um, what you're seeing here is the existing playground area on the left. Um, this is where your play structures are. Play area so is a green space in the middle. And then the reconfigured parking lot drop-off. Uh, the red arrows show the directional slope throughout that space. Um, and then the parking lot, the drop-off and pickup. Um, if you were part of the tour, um, Don Ranch has a very similar lot configuration, what we're really trying to achieve here is directional flow and really have it be very strategic so it's constantly moving in a circular pattern. And that's what these one way uh, tend to do. And also, we want to minimize people backing up into a drive aisle. Um, so the one way where the drop off is around the perimeter, um, there's a bypass lane um, to allow people to pass by without ever having to back up in that drive aisle. There's also a sidewalk all the way, proposed all the way around that to allow for direct access to, um, to the main entry doors from that location. Questions, comments? But, uh, a couple extra reviews um, that we're looking at here. So the one up on the upper left is the transition between the existing facility and then the gym on the left. Um, this main street area, uh, basically it's a light filled uh, area from daylight from above and then daylight from the side. Um, we're hoping to capture similar gable roof really throughout not only that clear story, that transistent roof that we're showing, but also in the entry canopies. That transistent roof and that gable carries them through to the main entry um, and trying to have the entry be more inviting, um, trying to have a little bit of signage up there, a little bit more identity and bringing in some more natural materials. We're also proposing that roof system to be a translucent roof to have more daylighting at the entryway and not have it be as low as it is currently. Just a little more inviting. Um, we are having a screen wall right around the entry um, to basically strategically hide and minimize the impact of the roof down there handle or that's placed in that location in that kind of underutilized space there. So some interior views of what we're looking at here. Um, so this is basically that main street. So this is that light filled area from above and where we're showing the walkway or what we call the loft. That loft area overlooks the library down below. It also helps to connect the second story main entry and just helps that overall circulation of that space. Um, you'll see that we're utilizing color in a very strategic way without overpowering that space either. Uh, we talked a little bit about railings before this meeting. We are bringing in some wood um, with the um, wood glue lamps framing that clear story window. Um, really bringing in some more natural materials in there to complement some of the stone that we're proposing as well. You'll see the light, you know, light into the gym, the light into the commons. It really, it meant this to be an exterior space on the inside is our goal. You'll see here um, prominent kind of clear story, um, chances real from above. The wood glue lamps displays on the left. Above the display is windows looking into the gym. And then on the right hand side is the classrooms. We're opening up those sides of the windows and then proposing some more natural stone within there. Should mention, you know, natural stone, very similar to what's on the wall here. Um, limestone is what we're proposing, very much native to this area. And then to complement that, the exterior is a precast sample here that's meant to pick up some of those same tones as well. 
So this is a view from down below in the library space. Um, you can see how we're utilizing volume of that space. It'll help with acoustics and really have this become the destination space of the entire facility. This is meant to be really the main organizing element for the entire facility and to be kind of the most playful space of the entire building. We are looking to capture some of these flooring materials and really have it bleed into the existing facility to have it be more cohesive throughout the entire um, facility. This space is a little more animated than some of the classrooms, um, but we are looking to have a consistent color scheme really throughout the entire facility. You'll see up on the upper right um, where the windows are looking in from down below into the library and just how we're utilizing a pretty cost-effective ceiling plane to really add some interest to that space. So on your views in front of you, um, there is a QR code. So if you take a picture actually of this, it'll actually take you to a link and you can actually see a three-dimensional model of this entire space. Um, so any camera will work. You just click on that link and you can actually scroll around inside the space and get a little better view of that as well. It's kind of you can play with more data. Um, so the last page, um, we started a uh, preliminary construction phase in the last time. I um, wanted to continue that conversation tonight. Uh, we have a little more chance. Um, so the the second to last page is what we're showing as option. Um, so this is the option we presented last time. On the last page is really our attempt at pros and cons of really the three options that we see as possible. Um, so option one is the current phasing plan that we're showing here on the screen. In a nutshell, what this is, is we're focusing on the building addition first doing the building addition, and then once that's completed, now we can move into the existing areas. What that really allows is to start the addition without impacting the rest of the facility, and then allows for more strategic switchovers of all the building systems, so your boiler system and electrical system, we can get the new one up and running before we have to do a switchover. It also allows for everybody to stay on site. Um, we don't have to displace any kiddos off the site or have temporary classrooms or anything else set up because we're able to utilize new portions of the building for that flexibility. So it's more, um, it's probably the most cost effective phasing plan of all of these. Um, the cons are, like we talked a little bit about last time, is we're going to be occupied during construction time periods. Um, we'll be building while we're being occupied. We'll try to maximize the two summers to utilize that, um, to do a lot of heavy construction during the summer, um, especially when we get into area three, shown in the spring there, where we're talking about foundation modifications, floor side modifications. That's meant to be happening over the summer time period, not while school's in session, because that is a noisy, noisier time period that will happen. So fall of 2021 is kind of always the pinch point of our overall schedule um, and all of these options. So that's when five classrooms will have to be relocated within the existing and or new addition um, within this plan. So it's basically those five classrooms. Um, there's, just, in our opinion, no way to turn that over in a, in a summer time period. It's just too much scope to realistically say we can do that. Option number two for comparison is start on the heavy renovation areas first um, and then do the building additions. Um, the positives of that is we're able to start with renovation areas. Um, we talked a lot about any potential unforeseen risks. Um, doing the renovation first would expose those first. Um, it could be a shorter overall construction schedule. So what we're looking at is basically April 2020 to August 2021. Um, it's preferred phasing option if we can find a location for eight classrooms, either on-site or off-site. Um, to do the heavy renovation portion first, we would have to move kiddos out of this building somehow, some way. And that's, if that's in the cards, great. If not, I think it'll we'll lean towards one of the other, one of the other options. Um, you're still partially occupied during construction time periods. Um, and any potential cost for any rental location would be another comment of this. Option three would be basically do everything at once. Um, what that would, in 
this came up in the last conversation, is basically if the contractors have free reign of this entire facility and there's no kids on site or no kids within the building um, and what that would look like. Um, obviously, we, we need to find a home for all of those um, and any associated costs or phasing schedules associated with that. So temporary portable classrooms, um, one we'd have to find a location for them that would be suitable either on this site or at this site. Um, usable site area is pretty limited at this area. Um, more than likely we'd be talking football field or something like that. The logistics of realistically doing that is we'd have to get utilities over there. So we'd have to get basically all of the utilities, sanitary, water, all of the utilities. Um, we also have to run a temporary classroom through the state review because it's an occupied portion. So you have to meet all the same requirements of a full occupied building, even though it's only temporary time periods. And that's really what drives the cost. So you have to have fire alarms, you have to have all your emergency egress, you have to have all the same requirements, you have to have accessibility requirements that you would have in a regular classroom. And you, you shared last month kind of a per unit cost per month, and you said that was what? Typically, um, finding something that lets you do it is kind of a challenge, actually. Um, we did reach out to a couple um, contractors, and also the contractors rent portable um, construction trailers. We could not find a confirmed cost um, for this. Um, the last time we did this was in Prescott, Wisconsin, and we ran off temporary classrooms, and um, that was some years ago, but it was in tune of about 10000 a month. Per, I mean, it, it, it drives up the costs pretty significantly. Um, it, it can be very significant, and it's mostly getting them on site, getting it operational, going, making sure that it's a occupied space. So we tend to we tend to avoid it if at all possible. Um, option one is really the only of the three options that avoids that in the entirety. Can you talk in a little more detail how you would be able to avoid that? What the temporary classrooms could look at? It basically be in that library media space. Either library media part. space or um, that'd be an option. Otherwise, the existing cafeteria would be another option. Um, because we have now the gym and the cafeteria to work with, there's an option there um, to utilize one of those spaces. It's really for about three to four months that we need some wrap up finishing touches in that area three. Um, so it'd be a relatively short time period. Um, so it'd be a temporary type of setup for that given time period. And that's where, you know, either you set up a temporary location within the new construction. Um, Barnabelle is the latest example of that where we utilized we utilize all sorts of spaces for a temporary setup. And it's probably not ideal, but that's kind of what we a lot of times will have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so they utilize storage spaces for music program. Um, another option is can we utilize you know, the art space or the music space that maybe isn't occupied all day long and then it becomes a scheduling conversation. Can we utilize those for some secondary type purposes? So if this is kind of why we're talking about right now is we want time to be able to plan those type of what ifs. And to be honest, some of this really does depend on what contractor is successful on bid day as well. Some just have more capabilities to push along the schedule, some just don't. What we want to do is set up base parameters so that everybody's bidding apples to apples and that we set up the parameters that they have to meet. Um, it becomes contractual at that point, so it would be a breach of contract if they don't meet those dates. So that's why we're really focusing on that at this point is so it becomes contractual for the contractors. Thank you. So what are you looking for? I, I think... Uh, yeah, I, I guess none of these options really have a direct impact on our schedule. I think before we send this out to bid, we'll want to hone in on schedule. Um, we want to present this and um, for a conversation and then help to you know just down as we continue moving forward. So we're looking to bid this out at the end of January, being part of February, so that's kind of the timeline that we're looking at. So you'd like to know which direction the board is leaning towards it, by I think January. It'd be, it'd be preferred, yes. Does anybody have a strong preference at this point? 
I do. I think number one, I, I'm going to trust them with their estimates on uh, what's going to happen in the area of the year, but I, th I think it's a good plan to start with the new. We're going to be committed to this anyway, so uh, that way the kids aren't off site. Um, and I'm hopeful area three doesn't give us trouble. Mm -hmm. We did also talk um, during one of the core team meetings that while we're saying area three has a certain time period associated with it, what we'll do is when the conservation on site do selective demolition of that area to do selective investigation more intensive than what has already been done they can cut all different floor slab areas to do more sampling of that area to have a better comfort level going into it as well during the construction of area, area one currently and some of, of doing option one also helps us with our water problem too doesn't it so it, it will yes yeah. Because you're building the addition first, or are diverting water around the facility. Mm -hmm. and then How about you, motion? Yeah. Sure. I'll move we instruct HSR to go with option one for construction phasing. I'll second. Okay. Anybody have any other comments so, or questions? Tim, that, that is your preferred op option. You're advising the board. Uh, unless you have a suitable location. Maybe in our community is not full of empty schools. Exactly. Yeah. So no, we don't have a suitable location. So I think option one then is it's customary for these types of projects to have that level of um, kind of movement throughout there. Um, it follows normal construction practices. Say you're going to do the addition first and then move into the mm -hmm. areas. That's much more common than the sequence for contractors as well. So I would recommend option one. Mitch, is Matt, is Matt still here? Can, here? can either of you or Mitch just confirm that there really is no good space to put these kids as far as a rental classroom area? I know there was mention about St. Mary's Church. I know, uh, I don't even know what else is out there. But I mean, and if you go, if, if you look, just go purely on topography, I mean, the, the cheapest option would be to not run water too, but you still have to run power phones, the fire codes and things, you know, so you, you put them in the lower parking lot at the elementary school because the upper parking lot is going to be a staging area for all the construction equipment, so as they're building. So that parking lot's out of question. The lower parking lot becomes your only option on site. And then for everything, for going to the library, going to band or music, going to art, going to lunch, going to the bathroom, will require a student to run up the hill to get into the building in order to access those kinds of things. You, you can put it out here, you know, on one of the level, levelist areas, but then you chew up parking for any kind of events that happen here, and you're chewing that up for, in essence, almost two school years then while you do that. But in terms of, like, current space, in the community, we still need to get. There's nothing that really would be. Right, you're still here. Right. Temporary classrooms. We would still have to have somebody go in through the school at uh, the Catholic Church, St. Mary's, St. Paul's, to do basically an asbestos test for us to, to make sure that everything is either covered or can be covered. That would allow us to occupy that, and I don't know. I don't know that they would have eight classrooms available, um, and it would be a cost for the school district to basically rent those rooms. And also, if I can, I, I think the logistics of having Matt or I over be in two buildings, when you think about music or Fayette or art, how do we split that teacher and ask them to go between two buildings? You know, some of those shared staffing I mean, Matt and I could potentially say, you know, you'll be here this day and I'll be here this day, but then I'm taken away from the high school or whatever. You know, I, I think when you start thinking of staff splits, too, I, I don't think that that's a real foreseeable option. I don't disagree. I just want to just yeah. make sure that the option's been fully explored. And, you know, and to that point, then, too, you also run lunches need to be sent in multiple locations. You know, I would imagine maintenance would be, you know, cleaning will be in multiple locations. I mean, there's going to be a lot of extras that, that go on that we probably aren't even thinking of at this point in time as well. 
basically, in my opinion, too, is it takes away from the money that we have for everything else. Because mm -hmm. the, if you look at the timeline, we're only adding a couple months on if we were all out of the school. So we're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to relocate the kids when we're taking that away from the referendum. That's my kind of thoughts on it, too. We're not gaining anything, in my opinion. I don't say that we have an option, honestly. I think option one is the only way to go. <coughs> I don't disagree. Is the upstairs functional in St. Mary's anyway? I haven't been in the top level for, for years. I know the main level is used. It's I'm not sure about the top level. functional. I mean, they have CCD classes right up there. Yeah. I just, we have a motion in a second. We're going to call a question. I think it's a good idea. Done? Yes. Lindsay? Yes. Steffes? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Chambers? Yes. Basti? Yes. Thank you guys. Thanks, Okay, let's move on to the audit with Justin Block. I'll probably just stay over here, maybe. <laughs> Quinn in to kind of go over our, our audit. There's a, chair, there's a chair here if you want. It's up to you guys if you want to come up here. <laughs> All right, so on, it's technically page two there, I think, if you scroll up a little bit. That first page there just kind of gives an overview that we came in and performed the audit um, for the 18-19 school year and issued our financial statements uh, with an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion. That's the best you can get. Um, and then the financial statements are the school districts. We just come in and audit them. So management does review and accept the financial statements and all adjusting journal entries prior to us issuing that report. Next page there is just kind of a snapshot of the balance sheet and then the summarized revenues and expenditures for the general fund as of 630-18 compared to 630-19. Um, and you'll note up there, the general fund does include all special education activity as well. Uh, so the, for the most part, the balance sheet, the assets and liabilities were pretty comparable between years. Uh, the revenues and expenses, um, also pretty comparable between years. Uh, the total fund balance, though, you'll notice did increase significantly between years, about $10.2 million, and that is mainly due to the capital projects fund increased about $9.7 million, and that's because of the $10 million of bond anticipation notes that were issued prior to 630, um, so that, that $10 million is in the capital projects fund balance, and that'll, you'll see that then decrease as the referendum project starts and the expenditures begin coming in. Um, and then the rest of those funds, pretty comparable, I'd say between years. Uh, general fund increased about 16,000. Special revenue trust went up about 40. That's the fund used for uh, your gifts and donations that have specific purposes, like any of the sports, FFA, FBLA. Uh, food service fund, that fund balance did not change. Um, because the for 1819 the expenditures exceeded revenues and food service cannot have a negative equity balance at the end of the year so the general fund actually transferred about twenty six hundred dollars worth to kind of cover that deficit for the food service fund um, and then fund balance went up about four hundred fifty thousand dollars and that's uh, because there was four hundred thousand dollars of referendum debt payments um, on the revenue limit this year that'll be paid for during the 1920 school year. Page four shows the fund balance of the general fund over the last five years. So for the most part, it's been increasing over the last five years. Uh, the district does have a policy in place to maintain at least 15% of next year's expenditures in the general fund fund balance. So. At the time that we finished the audit, the 1920 budget wasn't completed yet. Um, but when we looked at the 1819 expenditures, you were at 20, almost 22 percent, so above that minimum policy. The next page shows the revenues 
uh, between 19 and 18. Um, so for the most part, you know, the significant areas of taxes and then state and federal grants. So below kind of summarizes what the, the biggest state revenues are, equalization aid, special ed, sparsity aid, and per pupil aid, uh, which the state sets that per pupil aid allocation amount, which they increased it from 450 to 654 in 1819. So that resulted in an additional $140,000 for the district. Can I ask a clarification, yep. clarification question? So what you have labeled as taxes is local property taxes, is that correct? Correct. And then when you, so state and federal sources are technically taxes, but they're, but they're, they're granted grant from through, general yep, revenue. through Department of Public Instruction. Got it, okay. Yep. And what is uh, other local sources? What, what will that be made up of? Um, this is for all funds, so some of that would be any gifts, donations, Good look at the. Not sure what else would be in that. Would it be like our fees, Mitch, possibly? The yes, yeah. student, student fees would go into that category. Yep. Fees. Yep. Scholarships, possibly. Um, scholarships. Right now, we'll kind of get into that later. Anything that was in like um a separate FUM 70 scholarship account would not be in this category right now because in 1819 they're not included in the governmental activities starting in 1920 that may change um, but yeah I kind of will touch on that a little bit later because that'll be a change for the 1920 school year some of those journal entries that we have talked about approving mm -hmm. are, are a direct result of how our scholarships are accounted for within or through district funds so some of those accounting adjustments had to be done yep. ahead of time too so and we might as well just go into that right now there's a new GASB statement that's coming up um, that kind of redefines the definition of fiduciary activities so to be a true fiduciary account the district just holds the money for another organization so in 1819, the district had like student activity funds there, like class of accounts, um, student council, those activities where the district was just holding that money. But the students are responsible for making the decision for how the funds are raised, how they're spent. Um, so they kind of you know, really defined that. So in 1920, to leave those funds in that account, the students would have to be the only ones making the decision. There can be no administrative involvement from the district. Um, so we kind of have, we had a, there's schools are having a lot of conversations about that and whether or not, are the, are the students really the ones making those decisions? Does the district want the students to be the only ones making those decisions? Um, and I think, ultimately, I think a lot of those funds will be moved then into Fund 21, into a special revenue account. Um, and same with the scholarship accounts. So to stay where they are and be fiduciary, the person who donated the money would need to be the one who's deciding how it's awarded. They should be the one then picking the students every year and deciding how that money gets spent. So to stay there, there needs to be a trust agreement in place with the person who donated the money, and then they need to have involvement with that student, the recipient every year. So why the change now? Um, Gasby, you know, accounting <coughs> standards have just kind of redefined the definition for those, and Department of Public Instruction has been really kind of cracking down on how that will be implemented. But certainly, at some of these clubs, there is some administrative input, but a lot of it is from the, the club advisor. I mean, and the, the, is the club advisor uh, an employee of the district? Possibly. Or the student, because if it's the employee of the district that is the advisor, then that's considered district involvement. But there are some accounts like the class of accounts. Mm -hmm. You know, that's you know, should those those DPI you know makes an argument for leaving where they are, um, because the students are deciding how that money is spent and they'll take that money with them. I mean, so they we, don't have to. Do we have a case? Let's say we give the class of 2020 $1,000 for a uh, good graduation, whatever. So it's really the district's money given to that class. 
So what you're saying is, is if, if there's any employee or administrator make a decision on that $1,000. On that, how that money is spent. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, the, just by nature, fiduciary funds need to be made just, you're holding the money okay. only. Can, can we call decisions. it something else? Is there something else available that we could use? Um, you could still use a separate um, account in Fund 21. Just Fund 21. Yeah, like how volleyball runs or how basketball runs, where they're still going out, they're raising the money, they're deciding how to spend the money, donations come in, so it would run more like those. All right. In them, in them accounts, do you have oversight over them during this audit? During, yep, we do look at all of those accounts. Yep. And even the student activity ones, how they currently work, we would still audit those as well. How close do you look? Do you look at the beginning and ending balances? We do yep, take a look at beginning and ending balances. Right. Uh, cash balances we confirm with the, the bank right. to verify that's correct. Do, do you look at, let's say there was a check wrote out to Gary Sullivan. Do you ask what that check was wrote out for? We do scan the, we scan all the accounts and look for like related party transactions. Anybody on the board, an employee of the district, um, made out to cash. You know, we do look for those things. Yep. Um, and then, so then the scholarship accounts too, I think a lot of those will be moving into Fund 21, maybe all of them in 1920, because I don't think any of the current ones that the district maintains have involvement from the person donated. We have, we have several scholarships that they give us a criteria, we give them a list of students that meet that criteria and they decide. There are other scholarships that are, here's how much I'm giving. You give us the name. This is what we're looking for. Somebody that fits this criteria, you give us the name, and that's where the award goes. So in essence, there is a scholarship committee here within the school district that might decide who the recipient of that scholarship is. So, I mean, there, there is some of that where we need to make sure that we're following the, the proper accounting and oversight so that a lot of those things will be moved to the correct fund sources to make sure that we're following all the guidelines. Yep. And I know we started that lot we started that lot this last yep. summer making a lot of those changes. Mm -hmm. So the town mm -hmm. one actually would have been legitimate as of next year because Don named three of us that overseen that money for the ten years that it was in in existence. The last year was the last year and we spent it all. So that actually was and is the way that future ones could do it. Um, as long as nobody within the school district there has the involvement of who's selecting. Yep, then no, and then you'd want to draw up a trust need. agreement. I mean if Dr. Lindsay wanted to do it, for example, and he gave a million dollars and he said, Okay, I'm gonna and he talked to Larry, Gary, and Nate before his passing to set up that committee, then they're in charge of that money and they divvy out to whatever his wishes would have been. And I would say in that case, as long as there's a formal written trust agreement in place that dictates how the funds are allocated, you know, that might meet the definition of the state where it's in the current, where it wasn't 1819, I guess. Okay. The fiduciaries have to be bonded too, don't they, or should be? Um, I don't think that they have to be bonded. Huh? Okay. Not that I know of, anyway. And I will say too with moving those funds, actually moving them into fund twenty one will give the district probably more you have know, more involvement in it, more kind of oversight over those funds, then they have to follow the same procedures as everybody else. A lot of times in school districts, the student activity fund 60 accounts, uh, an advisor might come up and say, I need to check for this. Whereas everybody else has to go through the formal requisition process and approval. So it kind of makes sure everybody follows the same procedures within the district. Do we have a policy, Mitch, that you're aware of that all clubs run their funds through the school. If it is a school sponsored, then yes. If they if they are raising funds and, and then they, they would go through fund twenty one accounts. Good. 
because we moved a lot of things from Fund 60 to Fund 21 mm -hmm. for that same that same purpose as to if, if the students are you know, and even the forms have been adjusted that require student signatures. It can't just be the advisor coming in and as Quinn said, you know, hey, they decided to, they're going to buy you know hundred dollars worth of groceries at Point Foods. I need to check for hundred dollars. Here's the form. Mm -hmm. They now the students have to now sign off on that particular form to show yep that that or, that organization has made that decision to go ahead and do these things. And we aren't we don't handle any class hours anymore, do we? The old class? Not the old ones, no. Nope. You guys uh, implemented a policy a couple years back mm -hmm. that after, I don't remember what it is, after a certain time period, that those funds, if that class didn't take them, those funds would be turned over to the general fund, I think it was. Yeah. So it's only the current classes that are here. Yeah. How far out, Angie, do you remember? We just did that a couple years ago, so. We're, I'm talking probably 20 years or better. Also, not like last year's class. No. Okay. no. The, the class of 1990 might have $400 sitting I think in a class of. Up, um, but yeah. And take the care because they have to come in and sign off on, on any dollars. That's good. Yeah, yeah, we don't need to be charged for 15 Right. Yeah. So we're, it was a matter of trying to contact a class officer if we couldn't get a hold of the class president saying, hey, you have these funds available. You know, you need to set up set up an account somewhere or come in with an account that you have set up and we can sign off their signature, our signature, and the monies would just then transfer it out that way. But so yeah, that's been a I would say a multi year process trying to get all of those things cleaned up for past and you would classes. think being twenty years out of high school they should be financially financially responsible, right? You'd hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of it was, you know, we're using it. Sometimes they would leave it so they could use it for a reunion, or yeah. it was the a, a classmate's mother or father passed away. We want to send you know flowers or memorial. They, they would classes would tend to use it that way. Um, so you know, I think in total it was probably a substantial dollar amount, but it really wasn't. It wasn't district monies. We were they just left it with us walking away thinking it would always be there so it was a matter of trying to clean that stuff up. Any other questions on that? That's been the sig most significant change I think so far for 1920 probably for the office. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get in order. So then I think that page just shows the total federal and state revenue combined so you can see that there was a big increase um, during the 1819 school year. Uh, that was mainly due to that per pupil aid. We talked about that allocation going up. Um, federal special education increased during the year uh, due to the purchase of a special ed van, two additional special ed assistants quoted there. So that's the main increase, the reason for that increase. And the next page shows the expenditure comparison from 19 to 18. Um, different categories may have fluctuated a little bit between years, but for the most part, expenditures were comparable. Uh, they went up about $285,000 in total, which was mainly due to the completion of the roofing project here. And that page shows the changes in the long-term obligations, so the change in any long-term debt, capital leases, and then you'll see the anticipation notes there. Um, so due to their short-term nature, they're shown as a separate line there, and then they were subsequently refinanced during the 1920 year into the 9.94 general obligation bonds uh, for the referendum project. And the district does have a debt limitation. You can't exceed about $36 million worth of debt. Um, so the district is well below that total that the general obligation bonds to refinance that 10 million that will get added to that total in 1920 as well and then the last page there um, in addition to the actual financial statements that we issue there are a couple letters addressed to the board of education um, where we you know discuss any findings we might have had anything any recommendations for improving inter any internal controls um, so the first two findings there are pretty standard 
for Menor Point for all districts this size. Um, segregation of duties. In an ideal world, there'd be enough office staff to segregate every area of a transaction. Um, that's not cost effective or feasible in districts of this size usually, so we just disclose that. And we get that every year, right? Yes, every year. Yep, that one and preparation of financial statements that we, we do prepare the financial statements. Um, the next one, letter to the Board of Education. There are some areas where we have to use an estimate for the total. Um, the, these are just in the government-wide statements. Um, the numbers that you guys see on a regular basis are in what are called the fund statements. And we do, those are on the modified accrual basis. We do journal entries to convert all of those to the full accrual, where what you guys are used to seeing is fixed assets are expensed. Debt activity is re revenue and expense. These statement put asset, put fixed assets in the asset category, put long-term debt in the liability category. Um, so when we do that, there are some estimates we have to make, like how long will each asset, how long will its useful life be? So you know, we get that information from Marsha or Roger or whoever's preparing that. Um, but that is just an estimate, those areas. And then the final section there, management letter points. Uh, the credit card disbursement one was actually addressed during the 1818 school year, so that was not in our audit report. Um, but the student activity accounts, we did have one. We select a sample every year, and out of the sample, we did have one that didn't have the student signature on it, indicating that they approved it, and that kind of feeds into the next one there that we've al already discussed on fiduciary activities, that it should be the students that are approving those expenditures. Um, but otherwise, the audit went well, as always. So... If there's any other questions? Anybody? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 A reminder, December 27th. 5 p.m. December 27th with a plea to not wait until 5 p.m. on December 27th is the deadline for any incumbent to file notice of non-candidacy. So that that would be Jeff, Tony, or Gary currently. So if you are not planning on running for the school board again, uh, we would ask that you notify Angie. The deadline is 27th at 5 p.m. But if you've made your mind up sooner, please notify her sooner. And then the deadline for anybody to file wishing to run for the spring ballot is January 7th at 5 p.m. So if there are people in the community that, boy, I wish I could, wish I knew how to get on a school board, you could say, hey, by January 7th at 5 p.m., stop at the district office and, and fill out the paperwork for candidacy. So that kind of where we're sitting right now. Those, those deadlines are fast approaching. We are having um, um, anybody that's interested in running for the election a meeting next Wednesday, the 18th. Pardon? Six, six o'clock here, 6.30? Or the, oh, the 11th. The 11th. Oh, is it the 11th? This Wednesday. This Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah, this Wednesday at 5 p.m. So anybody running, interested in running, try to answer as many questions as I can. I'm sorry, is that going to be in this library or the elementary school? It'll be up here. It'll be in this room? Yeah, in the library. In, in this room. In this room. Okay. okay. Throw them right in the fire right away. Yeah. Good. <laughs> scare them. So just some updates for, for the election timeline. Uh, budget comparison. <clears throat> In at the end of November a year ago, we had spent out about 36%, just a little over 36% of our budget. Uh, and looking at this year, we have spent out just under 35%. So we're very, very close on line where we were a year ago. Um, 
And as Quinn had mentioned, you know, the ten million dollars will show up a little differently coming out. Um, work Marshall working with uh, someone through the DPI. It's like okay, we remember we did a ban no bond anticipation no we borrowed 10 million dollars right out of the gate we were able to put that in some investments and start to earn interest on it then the bonds were sold so the 10 million we got from the bond sale turned around and paid off the ban that anticipation note mm -hmm. um, so accounting wise it looks like we have spent out about a hundred a little over a hundred percent of our budget already but that's because it in, in in trying to indicate, yep, ten million came in and ten million has gone out. They had to put that in um, debt retirement. So this six hundred area here, if that ten million dollars was in in this amount of money, it would show that we've spent out more than our budget. I said, well, if, if that's just for the DPI's accounting purposes, I want to know where are we actually. So this is our actual. The actual money spent through our current budget so we're right around the same expenditures same rate of expenditure as we were a year ago okay um, school district report card we had our board meeting on that Monday and Tuesday was when information was available to be shared with the public so I downloaded our public report cards um, you have a copy of the elementary school report card that says that an 86.1 they significantly exceed state standards uh, and this is on the DPI so you can go to the DPI's website under the public report cards and, and, and pull any of that information up so elementary school middle school at 83.0 significantly exceeds high school 83.1 percent significantly exceeds state standards and then as a district 86.4 percent so as a district significantly exceed, exceeds state standards so this is the first time in essence all three buildings were being scored in a similar fashion and being able to have other factors that weigh into that overall score certainly push the high school to a different category. Questions? First of all, well done. Um, I could not, um, I tried to find like where because we were ranked number two for a while. Do you know where this puts us in yeah. the rank? Um, that I, I care a whole lot, but I'm um, just curious. Yeah, we one year we were number two, then we were, I think, eight. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we have gone in far enough now to find out what this score does for it, what like our rank in the state would be. Oh, really? Yes. I, I have not taken the time to do that. I can certainly ask Joel to put that. That That could be. Um, I thought I had something came across. I, don't I was I was just curious. No big deal. Um, this is great. Uh, so yeah. So you mentioned the the high school. Uh, I think the reason for one of the reasons for the having difficulty to get uh, significantly exceeds was because we didn't meet criteria for the closing gaps. We so were never scored there. We were never scored there because we didn't have enough. There was there was there, was there was nothing that they would use to show any kind of student growth or any kind of closing any gap. Eighty some percent of the score was purely that test score. Right, but you have to meet. You have to have a certain. So this year, it changed, your student this year it changed in that they're counting the state summative assessment, the Aspire test that our freshmen and sophomores take as part of the school growth. So they have a freshman, sophomore, junior ACT component where in all other years it was just ACT only. I see. So there so is a way to measure because ACT Aspire is an ACT suite. So now they're counting the freshman and sophomore and looking at the scores of those classes over time for a growth. 
Okay. And so now that's where they get the closing so gap this is score as well. One. So they show school growth and closing gaps. So our students have taken the ACT Aspire for a half a dozen years, but their it's scores not. never counted towards anything on the school report card until this year. If you look down at the priority weights area, student achievement is now 36.7%, where before that was 80%. Because this closing gaps was not applicable. Because applicable. Yeah, there was, right. there were not those right. other two that, areas. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So help me understand the difference between growth and closing a gap because they seem kind of like the same thing. Um. Yes. So the growth really looks and correct me if I'm wrong, but the growth. So all of the students are scored in one of four categories, and the growth really looks at did we have me as a student go from below basic to basic or below basic to advanced and you get positive points but if I'm at proficient and go back to advanced even though I, or advanced back to proficient I get negative points even though I'm still proficient so it's really looking at the growth of the student from year to year and the closing gaps if I'm correct looks more at our demographics of group how did our students with disability score how did our students of color score um, where it's more of the ethnic racial mixture of students, students with free and reduced lunch and those types of things. I'll say the closing gaps is also compared to like the state averages and yeah. stuff. Where your individual school growth is again the kid. Yeah. Versus the so players. the growth is really like each individual student is marked of where did, where was I last year, where am I this year. So mm -hmm. if I stayed in if I stayed proficient and I was proficient last year and this year my growth is zero. If I go from proficient to advanced, I get a point. If I go from proficient backwards to basic, I lose a, I lose and we go negative. So it's looking at individual student growth over time and then they consolidate it somehow. Okay. Yeah, that helps a little bit. And I, the, gap, the closing gaps, I think, are kind of three areas that the state monitors to, like, you know, like the graduation rate is something that the state is working at overall. Right. Um, so then they monitor every student on what was our graduation rate last year, what is it this year, how is it? There's some formula. Well, I don't Why is it not applicable for us? Uh, it could be class size. Sometimes the smaller class size. So even if you go into that and break down, a lot of times our data is disaggregated where you won't see numbers because by identifying numbers, you might be able to identify students. So if you break down, um, you know, if you're on WISE data and you go in and you look at students with disability and you look at a certain category of students with disability, they won't tell you it because we might only have two students in the whole high school with that disability area and then you'd be able to figure out who that student was. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes our population size, our sample size, I think you have to have at least 20 in certain areas before they'll break it out so that you can't figure out which kid got which score. So if you look at the high school under race, ethnicity, and so on and so forth down there, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, those percentages, if a student, it's, it's, it's a multiplier effect too, so if, if I am from a household that gets free and reduced lunch and I have a learning disability and I did well on a particular test, I get, I get growth in all three areas, which multiplies towards the school's overall mm -hmm. score, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm growing. I'm growing as a special ed student. I'm growing as an mm -hmm. academically disadvantaged student, and I'm growing as a student. Mm -hmm. And they they try to make sure that there is nothing that will identify that particular student. So then they start to look at if if we don't have those cell sizes big enough, then they put it all together and look at, okay, as a district, if your district were just one school, do you hit those cells enough? And then let's see how your students did then district-wide. Can you pull up the middle school one real quick? <clears throat> um, I mean, great score, but the, do you know why the closing gaps was so low comparative to say the school growth which was really high yeah. have we been able to dive into I have the I have time to really look at that yeah I can but no. I'm mean, just curious you know I mean and that was just the one thing that stuck out to me as far as like 
is there a, is there a, an area for improvement there for whatever reason? Right. I, the thing there's, there's probably maybe our, our English scores possibly. I think there's definitely a, some room for improvement there. Mm -hmm. And what, what won't show up here I think as well and the rest of you can jump in and help. If I'm a seventh grader and, and my score shows that I'm really academically at a third grade level this year, and next year I'm an eighth grader and my academic level jumps to sixth grade, mm -hmm. There's you get a lot more growth because you're getting that student caught up to that supposed level, you know, that this is the level they're supposed to be at. So you get that bigger growth and when you're not, if you just have a normal growth, if I if I go from seventh to eighth and went from third to fourth, that's, that's normal growth. So I'm not getting extra points, you know, or, or getting a better score for that growth. Mm -hmm. And that that plays into that growth, and or, sorry, that, closing gaps. I think that's one of those hard things too. Is you know we have really high performing students, but think of if our students are already all performing at proficient, where are we going to go from there? So we don't get rewarded to stay there. Mm -hmm. We only get rewarded if they keep moving. Mm -hmm. um, and so like our students who are already advanced and proficient, and we have many of them. There's nowhere to go once you're proficient. You know you can't go above proficient, so you get no bonus points for being proficient you just get a zero um, weight factor so I, I think when you start having multiple years in a row and, and you know and we credit to all of our teachers oh. our students are prepared but those those you know then those few slides back in a year or two or here or there are more evident because we just don't have, we can't continue to keep growing students who are already performing. Right. I mean, we're keeping them up where they're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be doing, but we're not getting weighted for closing gaps when there, when there are no gaps to, to close. So, so I mean, it, it, if I understand it, I mean, if we have high-performing kids, we're going to score high on the student achievement. Yes. Right? But which, then, which but then your closing gaps are going to be lower because there is no gap. There is no gap. It, or, or the few students who are not, per, you know, it's. But our, but our only school have high, yeah, right. hypothetically only have one five students who are not performing, and one of them moves. That's only twenty percent. That's still a big chunk of how many of our students moved, but percentage wise. All, all of these, all of these test scores are based on a test score. Nothing is based on anything that we're assessing in the school. It's all based on the test. And the test in itself is inherently fallible because um, some kids are good test takers and don't get anxious. Some kids get very anxious. And, um, so you, you got to take it with a grain of salt, too. Right? But that would hold true in every school district. Correct. So at least that's level. Yep. What did you have, Deb? Years ago when they came out with this, big problem and they said this is going to be all the way down the road you can have a school that's doing great and they keep doing great but they can't keep getting that much better because they've been doing great they end up falling behind they end up getting bad scores so it was just a problem with the program they have so can't take it with a grain of salt i mean it's certainly <laughs> worth looking into what just the only reason, just, I, the only reason I, I, I mean i this is fantastic Seriously, I mean this this should be celebrated. We should have a huge party. I mean <laughs> teachers should be congratulated You know Seriously, this is really really great. I just think we have very few data points to say where can we where do we have areas that need improving and where can the board? You know maybe make priorities in the budget to say you know if if, if Vicki came up and said you know what you know why our closing gap is so low because I don't have a reading instructor for my six kids that are at third grade reading level, and I couldn't help them as much as I could, you know? So if Vicki came up to me and said, I know exactly why our closing gap is low, and this is what I need, I, I think that would be something Absolutely. for the board, the board to know. But, uh, you know, if, if you also came and said, you know, this is a skewed score because this, this, and this is stacked up against us, you know, kind of like the presentation we had last year, you know, that would help us make some sense of it. But yeah. If it's an indicator of something that maybe we need to devote more resources to to help certain, maybe this is a sign that certain kids aren't getting the help they need. It'd be good to know. Right. 
That's all. And I think like it's, it's, it would be good for us to to dig into this and see if there's a if there's something that we can put our finger on that would be worth asking for more resources towards. When are the tests taken? The they keep what? End of March. Spring. End of, the end of March. March. Yeah, the end of March to the first week of May is the window. So most of April is kind of that sweet testing time. So if they would happen to miss school that day, are they given they an have opportunity? To make it up. They have to make that up. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's about six weeks the state gives us to test. Okay. So they took this March, April, and we get the results mm -hmm. released November. to us November. Mm -hmm. So it's tough, very tough. Mm -hmm. But it's still worth looking at. Well, and like Matt said, I mean, this doesn't include your own assessments, so you probably know how these kids are doing, right? You know, and what they need. And, but that's good for us to you know. Can, yeah. You can mine down into the data and look at one, one thing that is helpful is looking at specific types of test items that they don't do well on. So if it's, 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 and it's connected to a standard, so then to look at some instruction around certain standards like integration of knowledge and ideas in the common part. Mm -hmm. And you can design instruction. There is some value to it, but it's some of the So, Dr. Lindsay and Gary came in. We looked at um, several options. We looked at uh, and asked several school districts. Uh, we are a, a WASB school. The other one is NEOLA. And NEOLA stands for Northeast Ohio something. Is ba and, and basically, they will update board policies. Um, one of the districts that is a NEOLA school district, I said, okay, what's your policy? And it was very similar to ours. I said, okay, what happens? What happens if on the first vote it's a tie? And the district administrator said, that's a great question because we have there's nothing in their policy to talk about how to break a tie or how to do anything along that line. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the suggestions that came in, basically the change came to some, uh, our bullet number two here, if a vacancy has not been filled by an appointment within 60 days, that would be at a regular board meeting, there would be an election. So, um, the information came out said after two rounds of voting, no candidate has received a majority of the board vote. The school board will adjourn into closed session to discuss any of the remaining candidates' qualifications. Upon returning to open session, if there are additional questions to ask, the candidates' board members may ask one or all of them. A third vote will be taken at this time. If there is still no candidate that receives a majority vote, then the random drawing will determine the winner. This allows the conversation was allowing board members an opportunity to talk about. Well, maybe maybe I need to hear I hear something in closed session about one of the candidates that makes me think, okay, yeah, that makes good sense. That that person seems like it would be a good fit. It allows you to have a conversation about the potential candidates. Um, they would have submitted a written information. They would have had an opportunity to give their talk, their little speech, little presentation to you. You can vote twice, but now instead of five rounds of voting, it's down at the third round <clears throat> would be an opportunity to break the tie with a random, and it needs to be some kind of random draw. Uh, deck of cards, name of a hat, toss a coin, roll the dice. It, it just has to be random, and that, that is from the words of Bob Butler. It and needs what, to be what we found to is other school districts had that random, so ours was not that bizarre. It struck me as bizarre, mm -hmm. and maybe all of it, but actually several other school districts yeah. have that random draw after so many failed votes. A uh, couple questions. So when it does a random draw, let's, remember when we, when we voted, when we got to the random draw, before that, there were some candidates that were excluded from the random vote because they didn't, because get, they didn't get any votes. So is it specified in this policy? I, I couldn't see. I think it I says the ones that are left. Yeah, the ones that are The remaining candidates. So just kind of saying the remaining candidates. Remaining candidates. Okay. So if there's a third vote taken after the closed session, and say there's, say there's three candidates and one candidate doesn't get any votes, would that candidate then be in the random drawing? 
No. I would say. I would say. Oh, oh, so, no. No. He said he's kind of out already, then he'd be up to. That's right. right. But that's a good question. We might want to just get that clarified here. I'm about to have a quick call tomorrow. I would, I would say he's out. He's gonna, I, would, I would say so too, but it doesn't really specify there. And we could put that in the policy that uh, that a candidate needs to receive a vote to continue into each round. I think that. Yeah. I mean, Good because you way. have you. This is, yep. This this policy language came from Wasby, but there. but but we it's can. Well, you're going to closed session to discuss the. No, I know, but right. I thought that it said earlier that they had to get a vote oh. to continue on. It, it may that was what we had used in <clears throat> the past board session and it might say that in here the other question I had guys um, was if there was a discussion about like ranked voting but what ranked voting oh ranked voting where you know you rank you know your top two favorite your top three favorite and then that way there's kind of a, it would be less random and it'd be easier to pick a winner. You know? I didn't see that in any of the other. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm surprised that so many policies had just a random drawing. It, 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 it was, was, it was really surprising. But I didn't see a random Unfortunately, I don't really. think most boards have had that problem that we've had. It's such a you hard, have a large for everything else. number of people that <laughs> want it to be on. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's a good problem for us, but well, I'd be in favor of setting a precedent by not in by by figuring out how to how to solve this problem without a random vote, without a random draw. I'd be in favor of that. But ranked votes are not as simple as they seem. No. You know, if you ask any MIT <laughs> mathematician, um, there's a lot of a lot of ways it can be done. But. We'll have to have a statistician. Well, this is better than what we had. Because at least it's gone from five to three times. And and some of the options were, you know, they, they gave increments of five. So, you know, you, you could go five rounds, you could go ten rounds, you could do 15 rounds. Yeah, that was crazy. And it's like, I, I didn't think anybody wanted to go through 15 rounds of not selecting a, or having a majority vote. I do, I do like the idea of the board being able to go into closed session yeah, because that was good. Doc may say something or Larry may say something and it's like, oh, I never thought of that. Okay, I've, I'll change my vote. Mm -hmm. And look at the positive so. Well, well the, goal is to, the goal is to pick the, you know, the goal is to hopefully make a cohesive decision for the best candidate to work with the team. And <laughs> it does make sense to be able to have a discussion about that even though there may be disagreement, you know. So listed on an agenda, Mitch, in the future, will we have to put closed session on it? Pertaining to the possible... Uh, so if if somebody were to leave midterm, right, and we were going to have the board meeting to select a replacement, we would probably stick closed session on there, mm -hmm. just in case. You'd have to. Right? Right. So, I mean, do you think you'll remember that when we would look at the policy? Mm -hmm. Oh, you would just refer to the policy yeah. when making yeah. that agenda. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is the first reading, not necessarily for full approval, right? Correct. Right. Right. have two, yeah. and then, you know, modifications are done by them and we vote on it. So this is just the first reading. Right. So if Dr. Dunn could figure out how to do the weighted thing, can you bring that next meeting? Yeah. Or we just continue on with this policy. Do you guys want me to do that? I feel after we have a discussion. I don't, because always session. splitting hairs. I mean, it becomes statistical, really, then, as far as, you know, so, like, there's so many, let's say, a candidate got so many ones and so many, t I mean, it becomes percentage points. And, and it know, does. It, but anything is better than random, what do you say? I'm not so sure. I know what you're saying. That's, that gives a supposedly clear mandate to whoever wins. Well, I would, I would wins say the, more clear. Yeah. Also, or less random. Le, yeah, it was definitely <laughs> less random. Oh, is it random if you end up going to closed session after the two votes? Because you're at a... No, we would, we would vote after closed session, and then if that's a stalemate, 
then we go to a drawing according to this. Okay. But hopefully after, after closed session, you come out with somebody a somebody with the back and forth, hopefully we could come to a conclusion. That's what we thought. We thought the closed mm -hmm. session was the key, really, because oh, that would be we're discussing uh, I see the what Aaron's saying, but I also, I like the way this is, this is a lot better than what we've had in the past. It gives you an opportunity, not that there wasn't an opportunity to discuss any candidates, but in closed session gives you an opportunity to have that discussion, a candid discussion, about any of the candidates and, you know, and is it quite, does a question come up that you might want to ask coming out of that session to say, Okay, you know, okay, let, let's ask this question. Let's ask this question of all of them. And, and, then, and then you vote again based on, on the information you gathered for that, that last question. It allows, it allows you to have that conversation before that next round of voting. Right, and it would, it would maybe would take away from the chance of somebody coming to the next month's meeting and saying, well, why did uh, Joe get his name put in half three times and Bob only once? Why did you guys do that? What was your reasons for that? That's what you're thinking of, a less random or a, a weighted no, 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 I mean, it was kind of more of, of adding up the, the scores from yeah, the book. It's not throwing her name more, you know, not something. No, I just want to be a... Like a first and second choice. And then yeah, but if there's first choice could be worth five points and... Second choice is three. Well, then if you got three first place, that's 15, and three yeah. second, you got nine, that's 24. It seems a little more complicated. Which could still come to a tie, essentially, couldn't it? Uh, it could. Yeah. yeah. Well, if there's enough, enough yeah. people, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. Personally, I, I, I like this one. What this, add, what this added. And plus, it's making you do it in three. Yeah, five was, was, it was well, sometimes way too much. I mean, it only happened. Yeah, I, I agree. But you know, that's. Well, it's, it's less random. It's less random. Your guaranteed, I mean, the random is random. Yeah. There's, there's no but that's way. after discussion. I don't yeah. think it'll be random so much. I guess the question for this board is yeah. if we go to closed session, we have a hung jury, essentially. Yeah. How do you want to resolve that? Draw a name out of hat. Draw a name out of hat. I would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life's not fair. <laughs> let let, they, let they take over. Okay, let's. We're gonna go with this at this point, I guess, and we'll go second reading next so month. We'll bring it back next month. Okay, okay. let's move on to action items. So, um, I had talked about uh, information around the remaining monies for the building project, uh, and just about every conversation. I've been able to have with Tim and HSR, so Tim and Brad, you know, they're looking at the 11.92 is the, it, it, it's a doable amount of money. The project's doable and that amount of money. <clears throat> well, they don't have much choice, right. honestly. Right, right. Uh -huh. I guess what that, I guess the point I should be saying is, I don't, they're not coming back saying, yeah, we think we can do it for 10. <laughs> <laughs> or five or anything like that no. so options we can go back out and sell bonds for the remaining 1.92 million we'd have to go through uh, another rating through all those questions or because of the dollar amount it's op there's an opportunity to do it locally with one of the banks um, so basically, this resolution is for a general obligation promissory note. Farmer Savings Bank is on board. They've been working with R.W. Baird and can do this. Uh, and what would be needed is for the board to pass a, the res a resolution granting this method for securing that last $1.92 million. What was the interest rates they're offering? I believe it was 2.2%. Oh, wow. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, between 2.2 and 2.3%. Okay. 
I'll make that a motion and we accept it. Okay, we have a motion. Just give on a second. Is that for 20 years, Mitch? No. This portion will actually be paid off in five years. Five years. Okay. And this has all been vetted through um, RWR? Yes. Okay. And they're on board with it? Yes. I provided a final referendum financing plan for everyone. Mm -hmm. there should, everybody should have received one of these. Yeah. We need a second. Yeah. 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 Did somebody want to second that, please? Oh, sorry. Larry. 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 Okay. So what you see on the first column is the initial 9.94 and the second column the 1.92 so it's being paid back in five years um, and there's lots of documents to sign Larry you'll have to sign at least one spot but Everett and Jeff there'll be lots of signatures tonight so it shows the impact on the mill rate um, on the far left or sorry far right hand column mm -hmm. so if you remember in the, the initial conversations when Lisa was here, she was giving a pretty conservative, in other words, a higher interest rate, a higher, a lower bond rating, all of those kinds of things. A 20 year average mill rate of 1.78 or $1.78. Mm -hmm. Based on what we've done for the initial borrow, and then this 1.9, the 20 year average is $1.37. Yeah. Um, and it shows kind of the planning estimate that total finance would be 18 million. Final debt service now is gonna be about 15, so there is a savings of interest to almost $2.4 million. So we've, we've been very fortunate with a good bond rating, great interest rates, you know, the market being what it is, um, that, that it's been very beneficial for for everybody, yeah, it's an added expense, no doubt about it, but it, it's a little bit more of a cost savings on that expense. Will we use the, the, the 10 million first before we borrow the, the 1.9? If, if you approve this tonight, then they'll be working on setting up all of the things that will borrow the 1.9 and we'll invest it. You know, we'll, we'll probably split it between the two banks to try to earn interest, like we're doing right now on the, okay. on the 10, and, and start to spend out of it. But you'll see uh, there's a payment due already in the 2021 school year, will be that, that first payment. Okay, any other questions? Lindsay? Yes. Stephens? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Chambers? Yes. Done. Abstain. Fasting? Yes. Well, plenty of documents, thank you for it. I just want to remind you that the policy committee meeting we also talked about the homelessness with Andrew Klein. Yes, we'll be bringing that forward as well. Um, the school district will have to have a policy. We, we have a practice in place that we use for anybody that is considered to be homeless, but we're required to have a policy, so we'll have another policy meeting to kind of go over that language and, and bring it forward. But, and basically the policy is going to mirror what our current practice is already. So uh, Angie had been to um, a meeting on as the homeless liaison just to make sure that we're covering all of our bases. So that will be coming back. Okay. okay. Let's move on to the school calendar. All right. So, um, in essence, uh, based on HSR's recommendations, again, trying to have the biggest summer opportunities available. They're asking that we look at file, filing another waiver for next school year. So we were in the same position last year. Last year we actually had a couple of calendars because if referendum one passes, this is what we want to do if referendum two passes. If neither, we know, we know where we are. And HSR is asking us to look at starting early. So we're proposing a calendar that actually starts August 24th as the first day of school. And we would be done with school 
and graduation would be on May 21st. It would be the week before Memorial Day weekend for next school year. I met with the same calendar committee that I worked with a year ago um, to look at these dates, to look at how the calendar lays out. Um, everyone was on board as far as the committee was concerned. We need to have this meeting, it had to be posted. You have to vote on it in order for me to file the waiver request with the DPI because that has to come in January is when all of this information has to be to them. So we hit all of the dates that we need. Um, a, a, another issue or, or another item I would point out, um, spring break typically has been that last full week in March and in the 2021 calendar if we were to do that Good Friday is April 2nd so we would be we would have taken if we stayed with spring break at the same time we would have had a week off come back for four days and then had Friday off that following week and it came out of that committee suggestion say why don't we just move for that next year, move spring break, spring break back one week to line them up. So we capture that day, and so it's not an extra day off that we have to make up or find somewhere else in the calendar. They just coincide in the same week. So spring break would actually be the last three days of March and the first two days of April during Easter week. Somebody want to make a motion? I'll make the motion to pass or to approve the 2020-2021 school calendar. I'll second. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Did we get any, um, did anyone get any like parent feedback with the previous changes we made to this year's? You know, because we had some concerns about Labor Day and the fair and all of that. Did there any major issues? I didn't hear anything. Um, they didn't yeah. Okay, just, just or curious. curious. Were the kids or anything? Okay, let's call the question, please. I mean, did we, uh, Ask the class of 2021 and parents if they object to having graduation. I'm a parent of that class. I am all for it. <laughs> <laughs> I said year, that right away. Yeah. I'm in favor. And I, I, I shot this out. It's a year and a half prior. We got plenty of time. So there, there is, there is time. You know, when when graduations happen, and and everybody's like, boy, I love having it here at the fairground, and they book the fairground, or I love having it at mm -hmm. the Quality Inn. I'm booking the Quality, and then we move it. <laughs> I think then we would really run into a lot of issues and, and conflicts for parents. But I think a year and a half ahead of time, they'll know that if they go to a graduation party this year, hey, next year it's going to be a week earlier, and I want to book it a week earlier. They, they at least have that opportunity. I, I don't think that's an issue. It's personally, to me, it's, has graduation ever been any other day than the Friday of Memorial Day weekend? Yeah, it used to be on Thursday night a long time ago. Oh, yeah. 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 Of the same week, usually, Um, I'm not sure if it was the same week or not. I just know I graduated on the Thursday night. I mean, too. So, if, the, if you graduated from the old building, it might have been a Thursday night mm -hmm. for well, a long time. It's not like we don't have, a, have ample time, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. people are really upset that we contact one of the administrators and we'll deal with it at that point. This is a year and a half out. It, it was this, would the ceremony be different than the last day of school? For those kids? I mean, can you can you certify the calendar and still change when you hold the ceremony? Technically? No? Sure. I don't know why you come. I mean, because that's the question at hand, Kirk Larry, is the actual date of the graduation. Well, yeah. It, you're, not, the, not everything else. I, I mean, I've got that says we can't believe it on that Friday night, honestly. They get, get everybody out of school on the 21st and come back on the 28th. Uh, I think it, I think you should ask the parents of that class because it sounds like that's the only class that it will happen to, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Next year it'll bring you right back. And if there's a, if it's if it's a majority that's that's okay with it, yeah, go go for it. The waiver the waiver is for actually starting before September 1. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the waiver, and and having a calendar that was presented and accepted, but yes, it, 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 our last day is May twenty first. If if the parents said that, if our parents said we want graduation on 
May 28th. I know I'll be here, so uh, we, we could have still pass this if there's an upper about it, then you have graduates from 20 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's that's easily doable. Let's call the question, please. So we can certainly Chambers. Uh, yes. Doll. Oh, I'm sorry, Dunn. Yes. <laughs> Lindsay. Uh, Steffes. Uh, I'm voting no. Uh, because I think we had to survey the parents of that 2021 class. Sullivan. Yes. Best. Yes. Motion carried. I join. Okay, let's go over the calendar waiver. So a motion for that. Yeah, if you just approve applying for the waiver. Motion. Second. Any other questions? Comments? Okay, let's call the question, please. Done. Yes. Lindsay? Yes. Stephas? Yes. Sullivan? Yes. Chambers? Yes. Basting? Yes. School safety plan. I was so helpful to be able to tell you that the school film had been installed today because it was supposed to be, but due to an illness in the installation company, they're actually going to come tomorrow. So tomorrow morning, there will be safety film installed on the front doors at the middle school high school building, at the elementary school building, which will complete our safety grant that we had applied for a couple years ago. Um, all other all other items, I had shared uh, an email. There is a training coming up for brand new staff and support staff this Wednesday in um, it's alert or add. It's basically you know, another, another way of saying it, it's kind of the run hide fight uh, that's being presented by local police and county deputies, uh, and then. Eventually, we'll take the next step in an after-school, probably early evening training for anyone that is interested in the, the disarming component. But basically, we are up to date with all of our safety things, and no one will be more happy than being completed with the first round safety grant than me. Uh, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow having that final piece installed. So, not I don't necessarily need action other than. You're, you're aware that this has happened, okay? Okay, then let's move on to credit card statements and roll the bills. I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I will make a motion to uh, pass the credit card statement. I second that. Just the credit card? Uh, no, let's go with credit card and bills paid this way. Dr. Lindsay, if you see on the yeah, first page that. there. We yeah, dropped. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendously. Yeah. 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 yeah, I saw that. We <laughs> turned in our points and got yeah. some credit back. So. Yeah, 240,000 points are okay. <laughs> utilized. <laughs> Yeah, what they say the last one is the rest of the